Hello. Can you see us? <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to assume that this is going to be working. Hi, I'm uh, Philip Tan. I'm uh, the res a research scientist here at the MIT Game Lab. This is Paul. I'm Paul. I'm the developer of Game Blocks. And uh, today, this is part of 11126. It is a uh, online course that's being taught on edX.org. You should be able to see the URL on screen. There's a little short uh, Twitter URL that you can type in and then jump right to the to to the course. And uh, a lot of you, of course, are actually in the course. And, uh, and we're actually seeing your uh, text your text chat in the Twitch stream right now. And uh, thank you so much for joining. And this is this is going to be great. Uh, people who aren't in the course, you are totally welcome to ask questions. Uh, we are going to try to get to some of the questions that were asked on the forum first. Um, but most importantly, for people who haven't touched game blocks yet, this is also going to be hopefully a good time to see someone else using game blocks live and uh, maybe even take a couple of questions about game blocks uh, while we demo how that works. Because this is the first week where we have an assignment on game blocks. Yep. Yep. Um, so, shall we, uh, shall we just show game box first then? Oh, <laughs> or, okay, or we can do, do that. We, or do we do questions first? Yeah. I guess we can look at game blocks first. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So just close that window. Oh, there we go, perfect. Let me just make sure that it's on the stream. Yep, it is. So. Oh. Well, I mean, it seems strange for me to start with this, considering this is a game that Philip actually made. So, oh. do you actually want to show uh, and demo what you pulled off? Well, unfortunately, now you've 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 let everybody know I made this horrible flappy <laughs> flappy bird film. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this game was actually developed in about an hour, maybe two hours. Yeah, less than two hours. Uh, yeah, um, it is a flappy bird clone, um, and and I'll um, I'll just show it. If you played Flappy Bird or a game like it, none of this should be very surprising to you. It's not a great game. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things about having made this game was that um, it has different physics from Flappy Bird. For instance, you don't die as soon as you hit the barriers, uh, which you know it should be less punishing. And except the barriers now push you back, and this is sort of using Game Block's physics features. Um, now, every time physics happens in, the, in, in game blocks, it's a square, right? You're all squares colliding with squares. Uh, rectangles, but oh, yes. Okay. What happens if you rotate a rectangle, if you say to change the facing of a rectangle? Um, unfortunately, right now, it just become kind of confused and stay at the original shape that the original rectangle had. Okay. So that's one of the limitations that game blocks physics engine has right now. Okay. Ah, I can't that. So, so in other words, no matter wh whether the object on screen looks like a rectangle or not, even if it's like a, re a rectangle that was rotated, it's always still a, a 90 degree rectangle oriented um, parallel with the screen. For right now, yes. Okay, so um, this is being recorded uh, and uh, we are going to put uh, probably just the whole thing up on the up on the edX site. It is going to be incredibly long, um, but maybe we'll be able to do timestamps on something to specific questions. Um, Paul, what what should someone who is first getting into Game Blocks uh, be doing? So, if you first log into Game Blocks, uh, the first thing you should do is actually click on the big uh, click on the help question mark that you see here and then we have a series of five different tutorials for you to kind of go through if you click on any particular tutorial you'll be able to click and watch a video to see what uh, to see how to build it but in addition you can just follow the pictures and the instructions and go from one step to the next in order to build your first project so this is how I'd recommend to start. Um, we've had an extraordinarily active community within the forums who have been answering questions. So um, post up what you um, post up what you made and uh, have other people look at it, provide comments, and improve it over time. Yeah. So uh, we had a, actually a couple of questions already. Um, so the first question is, what's on your head? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was told because it was Halloween that I should come here and have at least some form of costume. So I believe this is from like Marvin the Martian within Looney Tunes, if anyone can see. Oh yeah, there. yeah. Oh, okay, um, it looks yeah, it's a side view. Yeah, yeah. It goes up like that. Yep. 
Um, I I was asked and I complied. <laughs> I think probably the best. Way I was to the one it. who asked him. <laughs> um, let's see. The other question is, what scheme blocks actually running on? Because you know we're, we're asking uh, students to program in these in this blocks programming language. Uh, let's let's show show them the blocks editor. Yeah. So to actually, one of the things you'll see is that uh, you're able to drag out uh, multiple uh, types of objects. So you can have sprites, and we can have labels, and then we can have blocks to actually make them uh, do things. So if I go to the events drawer, I can say when something of sprite class one is clicked, um, I can set a label's text to say hello. And by snapping these blocks together almost as if they're Lego bricks, I can kind of make things happen. I can click the play button and then actually test it out. If I click this guy, it then ends up saying hello. So kind of just switching between the design, uh, which I guess for those who are technically curious, um, this is just a canvas that uses Kinetic JS. Uh, this the blocks area uses a library called Blockly, uh, created by Neil Fraser at Google, um, and is the same that uh, same blocks framework that's used within App Inventor, another project hosted here at MIT. And when you actually play the game, it actually uses a game engine called Phaser which is also open source and available for anyone to use. So kind of using these different JavaScript technologies, we're able to put together game blocks that you see here. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm seeing a couple of questions on stream on why will anyone use game blocks when, you know, they to make a digital game instead of, let's say, C++ in a, you know, in a, uh, a hardcore game engine like Unreal, for instance. Uh, and part of that is because this is a this is to focus people on prototyping. We don't actually uh, want people to be starting with something like a full-blown game engine like Unity or uh, Unreal, uh, even something like uh, Game Maker, which is a 2D game e game e e engine. Before you even know whether your idea actually works, whether your idea is actually engaging and fun, and whether uh, you know it's something that you even personally would want to play. Uh, game blocks is a prototyping tool. Game 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 blocks is, is to ask you to put something very very quickly together, and for the purposes of our class, is specifically designed to make it very easy for you to share stuff with other people on the class, even remix their code. Like you, you can see what anyone else has made. Actually, can can you show how how you would look at somebody else's project? Uh, say maybe one of the de the demo projects from the front screen. Sure. Um, I guess the other thing to add probably to that is that we really want to make something that would work well within an edX course. And that kind of means if people are making games, we want it to all be online. We want people to edit the games online, play the games online, share the games online, and also not have to worry about necessarily knowing a programming language, being able just to snap things together to make it happen. So we are working to make add more game-like features to this. But we'll look at some of the demos that are so if you go to uh, gameblocks.org slash demos, or if you click kind of the demos link that you'll see up here, uh, then you can actually see uh, small projects that um, others have been able to do. These like individual game mechanics uh, that you can then, you know, maybe use in your own game. Yeah. Um, so let's look at move and jump, for example. So I can go ahead and play, and we can see how it works. It's a... Uh, it's this I actually don't know what type of animal that is. Um, it's, it's like a skeleton or something. Uh, it, it, it's, it's almost like a Pokemon, but it's not. It's like yeah, a raccoon. I don't know. Um, and as you can see, it just uh, is able to uh, go left, right, uh, and jump on top of platforms. And I'm using my arrow keys for this. Um, so I can go ahead and click View and Editor, and I can see how this particular thing was programmed. So we have classes of objects. Basically, this platform class allows me to um, have multiple of these particular types of objects, and uh, they're kind of all coded within the same way. Um, and then we have this one dog like superhero thing. We can look at the blocks, <laughs> and the blocks here are fairly simple. Um, I can say when the game starts, uh, forever it means it'll keep on going on and on. Uh, whenever the right arrow is pressed, it'll move right and flip right, 
If I hit the left arrow, it'll move left and flip left. And then if the up arrow is pressed um, and I'm touching the bottom edge, or if it's touching the top edge of any of the platforms, then it allows me to jump. Um, so if I got rid of um, this and allowed myself to uh, jump anytime the up arrow is pressed, what you'd see is I could jump here and here and all the way up, which really okay. doesn't create kind of a well, realistic you're playing effect. superhero now. Well, a yes, multiple <laughs> jumping superhero, sure. Um, so by putting uh, this back in, I'm able to kind of only be able to uh, jump when I'm actually touching one of the platforms. Mm -hmm. One of the things you may want to do now is uh, possibly add a goal. Right. You, right now you can jump on things, but there's nothing to achieve. Uh, there's no way to end the game, for instance. So if I uh, if I click plus, I can actually add a new sprite class, mm -hmm. and um, let's actually change the image from this uh, pink guy on skates. <laughs> um, so we have uh, all sorts of assets kind of already built into game blocks for you, um, and different types of them. So we can try to go off and get the green jewel. Mm -hmm. um, so I can close out the image editor and then actually just drag the green jewel. We'll make it like all the way up here. Uh, we can name this particular sprite. So we'll just call it like... You can have spaces in the name. Uh, uh, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't matter if, it, if there are spaces in naming. A no, it doesn't matter if there are spaces in names. You can name things almost anything that you want. Um, and now I can uh, create... Oh, I'll add a label. So we'll kind of uh, know when we've won. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, you have two, two labels in there. Right. So, like a score or something? Uh... Yeah, we'll just have it say you win for right now, I guess. Okay. Um, so I can say, like, when the game starts, we'll uh, go off and hide the label. We can go to the looks. And inside of here, I can, like, select um, any particular sprite. But we'll hide the label. All right. And then I'll say whenever um, the, we'll call it our superhero... Sure. And you can see the dog. updating everything. And yeah. you can see yep, everything's updating in real time. Right. Um, so, superhero dog. So, I can say when the superhero dog uh, collides with the... Uh, we'll make this the, uh, the green jewel class for right now. Okay. Uh, this specific sprite, the superhero dog, collides with any green jewel. It, uh, do something. We'll set the label to say... Okay. You win, and mm -hmm. then we'll also make sure we show the label. Yeah. Um, so let's try this out. So the green jewel is up top. I can go off if I'm able to get it, which would be embarrassing if I didn't, then it <laughs> goes ahead and says you win, which is slightly off the screen. Uh, so we'll move the text label further on, but the other thing that we noticed was that the uh, green jewel kind of got pushed to the side. Right, because you have physics turned on, on that, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so actually, let's just make it so that uh, when, uh, when we actually collide with it, we'll go off and hide it. So inside components, I can say remove, and I'll remove, uh, so this is kind of the first thing that collides, and here's like the second one, green jewel class. So I'll say remove collide E2, which will refer to the green jewel that we run into. So if we try this again, and I get there, it'd be embarrassing if I fell, there we then go. the jewel goes away and it says we win. Mm -hmm. So, so one thing uh, that okay. So one of the questions that we're seeing from the stream are, uh, you know, why will uh, what what what's the advantage of using a block space programming language over you know just 
writing this thing in, in in the text editor because like right now that's how you're coding this you're 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 coding you're coding this in the text editor basically and running on Vizer right so it's JavaScript yeah uh, um so one of the goals is uh, to make it easier for non pro uh, people who don't necessarily have a programming background to be able to make games. Mm -hmm. So um, things that blocks help you do is it allows you to avoid syntax errors. Uh, so you won't necessarily uh, uh, have your semicolon or your um, parentheses in the wrong spot. It kind of helps beginners to be able to do that. Also, when like I'm programming on a day-to-day -day basis, what ends up happening is that there are like all these commands that you have to read lots of documentation for or kind of guess what they are and spell them correctly and with blocks you just have a a, a a listing of them and you're able just to snap them together so you're kind of able to pick out of things that are already there to then put things together to make uh, hopefully interesting things mm -hmm. okay so um, at this point of time it's going to be really really hard for us to keep up with the uh, with the twitch uh, uh, we have to Twitch stream right, right now. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to switch a little bit to uh, questions that were asked on the class forums. Cool. And if people uh, who are in the class, you want to get a question into uh, in, 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 into the stream, um, uh, just open up another window with the class forums, enter it in there, and you can upvote things as well so that uh, we can actually be able to see it. Um, let's see what the top question is right now. Um, it's like a story or design, right? So, this is, this is not a game block question. Uh, so maybe what I can do is we we can go full screen. Ah. Um, actually, I didn't want both of uh, I didn't want this uh, picture in picture thing to happen. Okay. Um, so there were a couple of questions actually that are related to this one, which was. Um, should we? What's the role of story in game design, right? And uh, and and one of the the challenges that uh, is that when a lot of people actually get into games and really really enjoy games, a lot of them the first thing that a lot of people can tell me is that story is awesome. Um, and in many ways, that's going to be the sort of thing that makes someone decide I'm going to play this game because the characters are strong, or the setting is neat, you know, sci-fi, fantasy, it's historical, uh, it's contemporary, and uh, and it seems like that's going to be some interesting intrigue or character development or uh, catastrophic events going on in here that, that, that sound interesting. Um, the problem is that if your core gameplay isn't there once you actually get into the game, um, then people are going to start running into this barrier. It's going to be really hard to hold people's attention. Uh, they're going to you'll get you're going to get complaints like, "Why is this even a game when it could be a book or a movie or something like, or something like that?" And people talk talk about high production value games right now, even with those kinds of terms. You've got to make sure that your moment to moment gameplay if is at least usable. You know, it's not, it, it, at least people know what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, even if it's, say, um, a very much narrative-based game, that something that you will write in Twine, for instance, uh, then you have to make sure that navigating through that space is going to be as frictionless as possible. Uh, but if you want to to uh, to experiment with some other kinds of interaction, like I've seen some Twine games, for instance, where instead of clicking something and just take takes you to a whole new screen of text. Twine is a text-based game uh, game engine. They are actually changing little bits of text in the screen that you're currently looking at. So you're, 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 you're not going to a new part of the story, you're actually changing the story in place. Well, you've got to make sure that, uh, that your game mechanics communicate that to the person who's playing your game, you know, the person who's trying to follow the story and, man and manipulate it clearly so that they actually understand uh, how how they're supposed to be interacting with with your game, and once they get past that point, then yeah, then it's going to depend on whether your characters are interesting or you know repulsive, whether they're they're boring or or, or seem to have some sort of drama going on, and you can sustain that kind of dramatic ten uh, tension. In this course, we are not going to focus so much on story because. That's going to be highly variable based on the ability, your personal ability to create a powerful story. 
Some people are very talented and skilled at that, and some people aren't. Um, when it comes to game mechanic design, similarly, there are people who are skilled at that, but as someone who does design games, not uh, 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 I've been designing games for, for, for about eight years, um, I'm firm, I'm, I, I'm, I firmly believe that's purely a discipline and practice thing. That is a thing that you just get better at if you, uh, if you do it a lot. So um, what this course is about is getting people to think about design, not to think about coding so much, not to think about you know, how am I going to sell this game, although there will be a little bit about how all, this, uh, all our course material works with, um, with business. But uh, for the most part, it's how do I get into the practice of design? And uh, whether that's going to be digital design or paper or paper or cardboard games like the stuff that you see back there, um, that's up to uh, that's up to you. But if you can get into that habit of iterating and testing and practicing game design on all of your ideas, then I believe that just keep it up and you'll be, you'll get good at game design. Um, for story, there are I think this, is the National Novel Writing Month. Not sure. Okay, it's definitely coming up. If it's not already in NaNoWriMo, uh, that actually for people who are interested in story, that's kind of like the same sort of thing for uh, for for sort of uh, for for writing as it is for uh, uh, th as this course is for game design. It's the it's a disciplined attempt to just get get words on a page. The more you get words on the page, the better you are about creating you know narrative. Uh, using those words. So uh, people who are interested in improving their writing skills in particular, you might want to take a look at NaNoWriMo. But of course, um, that's National Novel Writing Month. But uh, if, you are, if you're interested in other kinds of uh, storytelling, visual storytelling, character design, uh, you're interested in things like world building, um, that's actually a really, really good course here in MIT uh, that you can probably find on ocw.mit.edu, which is MIT's open courseware site. Um, and it's taught by Juno Diaz, uh, who is a, a pretty well-known author and uh, has written some really amazing books about um, individ geek individuals for the most part. Um, you know, but uh, what happens to them is very much slice of life uh, uh, issues. He teaches a class here in MIT called World Building. So um, I'm not so sure if there's a link for that. If someone does have a link for that, put it in the chat. ocw.mit.edu is a really, really good way to think about world building. Um, how do you create a fantasy, or maybe even sort of art, uh, a, a, a contemporary world with some sort of narrative uh, potential? So, yeah. um, let's see. Let's see if we can take a game box thing. Sure. Let's see. Uh, so I guess one question that um, a lot of power users seem to have been asking, uh, who have been using game blocks a lot is that after you start building up uh, more and more complex projects, you see uh, more and more blocks on the screen, and yes, we do have the ability to scroll and that type of thing, but um, people really want to be able to have more room to be able to uh, get all their blocks in. So I guess one thing that we are looking to do but haven't quite gotten right yet is uh, basically zooming, so you can basically zoom in and out on lots of your blocks to be able to kind of see what's going on. The, um, the other thing that's kind of in a prototype mode right now, uh, we actually had an old version of our system. Oh, can oh, we oh, see? You, oh, you know what, let me switch to the, uh, to, yeah, there we go. Cool. Um, in an old version of our blocks editor, we actually had, um, the idea of script pages. So I can have uh, I have a coin uh, that I can have on our screen and I have like this piece of wood and then within the script I can say um, uh, when script when sprite class 2 is clicked I can set the labels text to be a say coin but I also couldn't possibly have all of my uh, wood um, things so when like the when a different uh, sprite classes clicked, I can have something else happen. Uh, and, and kind of the interesting piece of this is that you can actually drag blocks from one script page to the other and be able to kind of uh, organize your code in a much better way. 
Uh, we're working on getting this kind of uh, fully integrated within our current version so that you guys will be able to build more complex projects while not necessarily having to lose more screen, screen real estate to be able to get what you need done. So this is not something that currently exists in Gamebox, but it's something that you're that might happen this semester, or do you think it might happen in some future? Um, we're not sure yet. We'll see, depending on how many other things that we have. Um, so I guess someone in the uh, uh, someone in the comments is uh, mentioning that uh, Scratch seems to have this. Um, so uh, Scratch it was developed here at the um, was developed at the MIT Media Lab, and uh, we definitely draw lots of inspiration from them. Um, the some of the concepts are slightly different as far as uh, we have classes of objects that we can do, and um, we are able to uh, get uh, large chunks of blocks from project to project, kind of like the Scratch backpack. Um, so you can actually just like Control C. To on a particular thing of blocks that you have. I can open up a new project. And, and I'll go to a new project. And go to the blocks and actually just paste all the code. So then I can actually uh, actually move code from one project to project, which is makes life a bit easier so that you don't necessarily have to copy uh, projects all the time. The other thing that's important is that if you go to any particular demo game and you click on it and choose, we'll do edit, uh, collect cherries for right now, and if I save the project then it all of a sudden actually becomes part of my own games. So if I now go back to gameblocks.org, I actually see that it's one of the games I have on this account. So this allows anyone to go to anyone else's project and be able to uh, look at the code, play it, test it out, and uh, be able to make changes to make it their own. Very nice. like it. I mean, of course, this one was, uh, the other thing that Gameblocks also has that you don't see in things like Scratch. Uh, a lot of physics stuff is built in. Uh, no, it is still rectangular physics colliding with rectangles, but it's still, it's still there. True. Yeah. Um, one of the things that has been nice is uh, we the having gravity kind of by default is uh, mixed, and uh, some amount of friction allows people to make games a bit easier. Uh, so I like how this one looks. Hmm. <laughs> Seems like we're having internet connection problems here. We are? Did you? Uh, oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Um, so, this is a game that um, a well, student made here. Um, you have like this little stick figure that's kind of moving. And as you can see, the uh, it's uh, by. There is gravity enabled, and uh, they have different sprites kind of going in and out. And what you'll see is that uh, we also have this guy can have multiple costumes, can have uh, basically a look of him actually moving, and it um, the game kind of becomes more difficult as it goes faster and faster. As I'm going to lose right in front of your eyes, and hopefully it won't be terribly embarrassing. Uh, this so this was posted up on our forums. Uh, this is this is special. um so this is will be actually part of our. Uh, new demo pages that we're going to be launching over the weekend that will actually have a lot more uh, demos than what you see right now and also kind of include a lot of the games that people have made in the forums. Uh, speaking of which, um, there have been some really cool things that people have posted within the show and tell forums. Um, loading, and, loading. And... i got to make sure that this network connection is... Uh... Ah, there we go. So this one seems, uh, so this one has taken, is seems quite difficult for me to pull off. But basically you move this car and then if you run into run the robots, then you oh. see you start blinking and then you lose a life mm -hmm. um, up here. Um, but then what ended up happening was that even if I'm able to get up here, I don't seem to be very good at <laughs> jumping up. Have it's, you tried double jumping? Uh, yeah, oh, okay, you can't right. do that. Um, so, 
I'm not very good at this. But the cool thing is that since everything in Gameblocks is editable, oh, I can actually okay. go into the game and yeah, <laughs> let's make this platform just a tad lower um, to make it something that someone like me can even pull off. <laughs> and looky there, all of a sudden I'm actually able to get on top of the platform. Um, so uh, the nice thing is that you are able to kind of edit what's kind of there and be able to, you know, make it your own and possibly even making it possible for people who are, aren't as skilled players as I am. Yeah, of course you can do things like, cha like change the jump height in the code, for instance. Uh, you, can, you can just adjust the, barrier, the, the values in the blocks. You know, give yourself a, a gun if you want to do. Um, and so, yeah, uh, the, uh, this is uh, this this is going up on demos. Uh, um, so, uh, so right now, this is inside of the show and tell where oh, yeah. uh, lots this of people student, have. Uh, student project. Uh, yeah, uh, where lots of people have uh, put all sorts of projects and commented on them and played them out, and uh, we'll be including games like these uh, from the community inside of uh, featured projects that will appear on the game block site. All right. Let's let's take another question from the the, the class forums, um, and this is regarding some of the coursework that we had uh, this past week about the discussion of games as structured play, and what does that mean to games like uh, for for games like sandbox games, so Minecraft, for instance, uh, Terraria. Uh, do you, do you play sandbox games? Not not too much these days. Okay, I I I I have been told that by everyone that I should get into Kerbal Space Program, uh, and uh, I will one day when I'm on vacation. Uh, but right now that seems like a hole that I'm not ready to jump into because it's going to take too much time. Um, but I spent a lot of time in, uh, playing in Minecraft, and uh, one thing that it, that seems very very clear to me is that the game actually obeys very, very strict rules. Uh, it is still a structured play experience. You can go into like creative mode and get like, all the resources you want, uh, but when, once you start putting those blocks in the world, they are going to operate in a certain logical way. You can modify them by changing the game itself by, by installing mods, but uh, you, those are rules that you are putting in, in, in place. In fact, by choosing which mods they are going to install, they're kind of playing the role of the game designer by determining which rules you want to have in place. So it's still a structured play experience where you, um, no matter what you're doing in the game, you're still bound to the rules of what the game is allowing you to do. Question is, is it necessary for the game to tell you what goals you have? In survival mode, uh, which is a version of Minecraft where you, uh, you are you're actually mortal and you can take damage and you're and you start off with nothing and then you have to like slowly mine resources from the the world in order to, to, to survive. You know, there is already one implicit goal which is just survive so that you can keep playing the game a little bit longer. But if you um, but in creative mode, uh, the goal may be more something like what's the craziest thing you can make? That's that's kind of the implicit goal of uh, Minecraft and sometimes it's what's the craziest thing you can make with your friends. Um, and so, I believe that there are goals, and you can sometimes you some sometimes you have a menu of goals that you're choosing from. Sometimes the goal is simply I want to have a good time with my friends. I know we're just gonna like goof off and shoot arrows at each other, or it's going to be we're going to build you know a gigantic tower, or a huge underground cavern to, to, together, or it's myself is like what's the biggest explosion I can possibly make in Minecraft. Um, but you're setting these goals for yourself, and during that particular time when you're interacting with the system, you are deciding that, all right, I'm going to play the game of that particular goal. You're using the, the rules of Minecraft in the same way that you use a football field you know, to play Ultimate or something like that. You know. You've decided that here's this field of space, and then I'm going to play this game. Um, and, and when you are done with that, you shift back in a more sort of looser play experience where all right what's what what's the next thing I can do I'm going to just like goof around a little bit and try to figure out what my next goal is going to be maybe your next goal is figure out what your next long term goal is going to be so I do feel that that's still a game ex uh, that's still a game experience but it's neat that this question came up because I think we need to differentiate Minecraft the the tool in which you can play games and Minecraft, the game, which actually prescribes you ru uh, rules, like you are going to die if you take too much damage, and your goal is to survive as long as possible. 
this is unfortunately all bundled, or fortunately, all bundled into one software package. So you, you get a lot with just one one copy of Minecraft. Of course, everyone knows Minecraft is better with friends. So more than one copy. Um, let's see. Uh, I am going to take another question here. What's your favorite game? <laughs> this is by Satori123. Um, well, actually, um, my favorite game is actually four-way chess. Um, where there used to be an online version of this, where you could have uh, people all, uh, four people all sign in, and uh, you can basically move any piece on the chessboard that you want, and basically uh, capture and as you can move any piece that you want. And what ends up happening is as long as after you move a particular piece, you can't move it again for another maybe five seconds. And this creates kind of this interesting dynamic where you have two people working together to be able to uh, gang up on one particular person who you try to kill their king because you're following all the rules of chess. But what ends up happening is you don't want to kill them too much because you probably want to work with your ally who you're actually... Uh, well, destroy your ally before they're able to destroy you. So it allows different types of um, different types of dynamics that happen, you know, emerging through the gameplay. The in a lot of ways that was some of the inspiration that caused game blocks to actually be made in the first place. Hmm. Um, there weren't um, with block space languages. There weren't too many that allowed you to program uh, behaviors for um, large numbers of sprites and then be able to make a game as complex as chess but also make it multiplayer. Um, so actually Game Blocks was made as a multiplayer framework um, and we've kind of stripped out a lot of that functionality for this particular course um, but we'll probably be adding that back in for the educational games course that's happening in the spring. I've seen lots of questions uh, about uh, exactly what these courses uh, or where you can get game blocks and is it free um, all of this are part of the edtech x series on edX you can get to it for free uh, for game Boss specifically if you go to gameblocks.org you can uh, it will send you to the edX course and you can sign up and be able to uh, play with it on there but this is really a trial period for us uh, we're just releasing the software we're uh, fixing bugs as they come in and really we're uh, gathering feedback from community about what works and what doesn't so that we can improve it for future courses and others who will use the uh, use the program over time. Okay. Uh, my favorite game currently probably is just Starcraft 2. Uh, that's just a game I play every night uh, and it's something that helps me relax before I go to bed. Um, I'm wearing an XCOM outfit, so you can probably assume that XCOM used to be a, a, a something I used to play a lot uh, when I was a kid. But uh, I do like the new version that came out for consoles and is now available on tablet and PC as well. Um, I actually spent a lot of time in arcades, and I really miss arcade games. I love games that kind of still remind me of that experience of the very tactile feel of. Uh, hit, hitting buttons really, really, really hard. So um, I enjoy shmups espe es es especially, like Ikaruga is a great one. Um, and uh, that particular one is uh, difficult to... I guess, I guess it runs on Xbox 360 now, but I'm not sure if they've uh, made it available on any of the, the, the newest uh, pl platforms out there. So Ikaruga is a game by Sega but developed by Treasure, uh, which has a huge long history of amazing shmup games. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at. I'm not so good at fighting games. Though. Let's see. Uh, there was a second question to that, so I'm going to bring it up. Let's see. Are there ways for people to get people hooked except... Um, oh, okay. So this was a question about... Uh, the way how, say, gambling games and uh, certain free-to-play games get people hooked onto gameplay is to use something called a variable ratio schedule, or uh, what I would call a uh, schedule. It's like sc scheduled rewards. Uh, the idea is that 
you play for a certain amount of time and you have this random chance that something is going to re to to happen to reward you like pulling a slot machine you know every you pull the slot machine enough something is going to reward you and of course the reward in the slot machine is less than the amount of money that it takes for you to get to that point but probabilistically after a certain amount of time you are going to get some sort of reward and that gets people hooked um, you see the same idea happen in things like loot drops in uh, RPGs, role-playing games, and even and some massively multiplayer online role-playing games. The idea that if you just do this enough, you're eventually going to be lucky enough to get the thing that's really, really good. Um, that's a system that uh, we describe in game design as an extrinsic motivation. It is this thing that's been imposed by the game system to basically give you rewards every time you do something that you don't actually want to be doing. Uh, it doesn't even need to be on a probabilistic scale. It could be just a situation where you, um, you, know, you complete X number of things and you get a gold star. And that, that's how a lot of school works, uh, unfortunately. And the idea is that, well, if you really, really want that gold star, then you will do all of this stuff that you don't actually want to be doing in order to get that gold star. This is by far one of the least effective ways to actually design a game. It is one of the easiest ways, which is why a lot of game designers do it, but the problem is that the moment you lose interest in that gold star, in that achievement that, 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 that um, you might be getting, in that cash drop uh, or that equipment drop that you get, in well, the moment you, that is no longer interesting, maybe because you've got all the, the gear that you want in your role-playing game and you don't really want anything else. Um, then you just lose interest in doing the thing that you needed to do in order to uh, to, to to get the the reward. There was a pretty uh, profound experiment. Uh, I'm going to guess probably in the 70s, although it might have been in the 60s. A whole bunch of kids um, in in kindergarten were given uh, crayons and paper and just told to draw. Only half those uh, kids were told that if you if they drew something, they could get a star. And there are a lot of people who, and then the other half was it. No, you just you you just get paper and crayons. You draw. Um, so they did that. I believe for like a week, a couple of days, um, and then what happened was they entered. Uh, they came back to all of those kids. They gave them papers and crayons and just asked them to draw. No rewards. You know, it's just a drawing session in kindergarten. And the kids who got the rewards initially didn't. Uh, uh, on, uh, had a lower percentage of people who actually drew anything. Um, the kids who didn't get the rewards, yeah, drawing is fun. You know, it, 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 I got crayons, I got pa pa paper, I'm going to draw a house. Um, and so it is very easy for you to give a reward that makes an initially pleasurable activity not fun for you anymore, not engaging. It's something that you don't want to do because you've, you've taken the reward away. Uh, for me, it's coffee and loyalty points. Um, every time, uh, you know, if, if, if I go to Starbucks and they say that their card reward system is down, I go to a different coffee shop. Like, I literally will cross the road and try to find a different coffee shop because the only reason why I go to Starbucks right now is because of loyalty points. Uh, I have, despite the fact that I really, really need coffee, just to function. Uh, so, so it you know it, what, what should be a loyalty program uh, should should be something that makes me want to keep going back to Starbucks, and they do, and, and I will as long as they keep giving me free coffee for 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 buying their coffee. Um, actually, turns me off the coffee, and I understand how that works uh, uh, from a theoretical and logical point of view. Uh, psychologically, I can feel it working on my consumption habits. So. Um, the way to get people really, really hooked on your game is to make the actual thing that you're doing actually fun rather than handing out rewards uh, to get people, to incentivize people to do the thing that they don't actually want, want to do. And that's why prototyping is so important. Uh, without prototyping, even your best ideas may actually not be great and you don't really, really know. You don't really know whether your idea is going to work until you've made something that someone else can play. Uh, whether that's on paper, whether that's uh, that's digital, and if that thing is inherently fun, oh, it's fun to jump. You know, a lot of games have discovered this, right? 
uh, it, it, it's fun to do these little parabolic arcing motions across the screen because there's a certain amount of freedom that you feel about that. If you think about how high Mario can jump, uh, he's kind of crazy. He, 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 he can jump like two and a half times his, his height or something like that. Uh, that's something that we can't do in real life and it feels empowering uh, on, on a sort of subconscious level. Um, yeah, sure, you could be jumping for coins, you could be jumping to break bricks and things like, like that. And that's how a lot of people learn how to play the, the, the game. But if you actually look at the way how Mario is designed, they try very, very hard not to make the, the, the actual activity of jumping pointless. They actually try to make sure that you still feel that it's really, really good to jump. And every time they make a new kind of Mario game on a new engine, say moving from Super Mario uh, 64 to, and Sunshine over to Galaxy, where they like completely changed the way how the camera works and how the gameplay works, they still had to make sure that that jump felt amazingly good. So, um, so focus on those mechanics and make sure that the mechanics themselves are fun first. Uh, that there are, that whether or not there's a reward and, if, and, and then you can think about using rewards to say help people understand how mechanics work but if the reward is the end goal then as soon as that reward disappears uh, or people lose interest in that reward people lose interest in the game and that's not good. Uh, there was a few other questions. There's a free to play question. Yeah. Um, I guess someone's asking about the performance limitations oh, yeah. of yes. game blocks. And I guess I'll address that. Um, so, I guess there are a few. Um, so, if you create lots and lots of sprites, uh, right now the system is most, is not optimized for that. So, you should use the remove. I'll see if I can drag this up for you. Is my screen showing? Uh, oh, that, that, that's right, sorry, hold on. I, I forgot to switch that. There we go. Cool. Um, so if you're building something inside of game blocks uh, and you're cloning lots and lots of sprites, um, then you're going to want to use the remove uh, from game. Uh, you'll need to do this in order to make sure you don't have tons and tons of things just flooding. So. I guess we can try something out quickly. Uh, we'll have, when the game starts, we'll forever uh, clone. Um, well, I guess, actually, I have a better idea. Um, so we'll, uh, we can set a sprite speed to, um, sprite one speed to 100. And we'll see what this does, it just has it kind of move to the right. Um, but instead of having this one, let's actually create multiple sprites that we have just coming out. So we'll clone uh, sprite class 1, uh, and we'll put it at um, an X of, let's say, 600, and we'll put it at a random Y. So we can actually go to the math drawer and get a random number block. And we'll make it go from like 1 to 400. So we'll have it kind of coming out randomly. And lastly, uh, instead of setting the x speed to 100, which you saw went right, we'll have it go left by making it negative 100. And we'll change sprite 1 to use a block input. So I can actually snap this block inside. Oh boy. So let's see what happens. And then every. So we'll set uh, this clone speed to negative 100, then we'll wait one second uh, before creating another. So if we hit play, and I've done this correctly, we'll see that we have kind of multiple enemies kind of coming out. Well, if we kept this running forever and ever, you can imagine these guys are going to get slower and slower. So what we can do is we can go to events and say when sprite class 1 uh, collides with any edge, we'll remove uh, the collide, uh, the sprite that just collided. Um, so we'll change the weight so that it'll be kind of a bit less, weighing 0.1 seconds before creating a new one. 
and then you'll see we're able to create multiple sprites and then as they go uh, whenever they collide with this edge they'll go off and actually disappear um, so keeping this uh, adding the remove block will actually make it a lot easier for um, things to uh, not necessarily slow down your system as much we still have lots of optimizations that we can make uh, to make this easier but uh, we can actually almost create a simple game based off of this where we can have uh, a different sprite class and we can have this one just kind of follow our mouse wherever we go so we can get another forever loop and we can always have it point toward the direction of our mouse pointer and always set its speed to the direction of the mouse pointer. So now I have... oh, that was the wrong sprite. Um, we'll do it for sprite 2 in both of these cases. So now you can almost make a game where my goal is to have this guy uh, not get hit by these aliens and you see that uh, if I'm bumping into them then they kind of just move everywhere. Um, I can do something where I can say if the uh, if any of those robots uh, so I guess we'll call this like the uh, robot class uh, collides with any of my uh, I don't know we'll just call it a character um, anything from the character class then I can go off and actually stop all sprites and scripts. So it'll kind of just stop everything. So now I just need to avoid these robot guys, and as long as I do, the game continues, but as soon as I actually hit, it stops. And then I can kind of reset the game and actually have different things happen. So. So I guess kind of this almost seems like a boring game because I don't really see how you know how well I've done or kind of what my score should be at this point. So let's add a variable so that I can have a score. Um, so if I go to variables, I can create a new variable and we'll just call it score. And we'll set it initially to be zero. Um, and then every time a robot collides with uh, the edge, I guess we'll make it the left edge so things can touch the, uh, the tops and the bottoms, uh, we will change the score by one. And we'll create a label which will um, kind of have what our score is. And we'll set that label's text to say, uh, the score colon and then I can actually use a join block to put two strings together and I can actually just drag the score block directly from the definition into the join so now um, whenever a robot class collides with the left edge it'll remove the robot it'll move the robot change the score by one and set the labels text to say score plus whatever the score is at that particular point let's try it um, so I'm able to move this guy around, and whenever Inside. one of those guys uh, clicks the edge, it'll uh, increase the score for me. So, as long as I can remove them, it, so I seem to be doing fairly well. Um, one might argue this is slightly too easy, but then it actually stops after I uh, actually hit one of these robots. One could actually go off and try to make this more impossible. Right now, uh, whenever we'll we'll clone a uh, robot and then we'll wait a second before cloning another one. Uh, if I change it so that I wait a half a second, uh, 0.5 seconds before cloning another one and then hit the play, uh, you'll see that they're actually starting to come at a much faster rate. One that's so unsustainable that I may not survive very long. So um, we look for people to be able to uh, put these blocks together and um, tweak with them, play with them, and see what types of games they can go off and create. Okay. Uh, there were some questions about, you know, how game blocks uh, compare to Scratch. We had, we talked a little bit about that earlier, but then also some, some people here seem familiar with App Inventor as well. 
uh, I think that actually uses the same Lockly uh, uh, framework, right? Uh, yeah. So um, App Inventor uses uh, Blockly, uh, which is a uh, open source uh, blocks framework. Basically, it allows us to be able to have kind of uh, these blocks, but um, each of the uh, both game blocks has its own language definition, and App Inventor has its own language definition. Um, before I actually worked on the game blocks project, I would. Uh, was one of the people who implemented the blocks inside of App Inventor. Mm. So um, we really try to make these things as seamless as we can as you go through the different blocks languages that MIT has. If you've used Scratch before, you'll probably notice that uh, the uh, the drawers and kind of the colors are almost the same, um, from events to motions to look and sensing. But if you also happen to use App Inventor, you'll realize that these are actually some of the same drawers you have here with about the same colors. Um, being able to deal with control, logic, math, uh, variables, and procedures. So we hope to actually almost create a suite of different languages so that you can um, use the different uh, languages that MIT provides for different tasks. Uh, App Inventor is great for building Android apps and you can uh, build th games online and then connect it up with your phone. Uh, Scratch is great for creating stories, games, and animations and having them online and sharing them with your friends. And GameBlocks really just focuses on uh, creating things that have uh, use for people who are making games and really working on uh, gravity and collisions and creating classes of objects which we believe will be very important for people who want to make games on their own. Mm -hmm. um, just looking through the schedule, the, the list of questions. Oh, okay, here we go. Oh, someone had a question about the design of free-to-play games, and there's one or two people who also ask games about uh, 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 asked about games like League of Legends. Um, I think one thing to think about free-to-play games in general is that their entire game design is to drive revenue. Uh, whether that's a free-to-play social game that you play on Facebook or on on, on a phone or a big game uh, that you play on a PC like Le like League of Legends. Every single decision that they're making on how the game plays is designed specifically to make people want to spend money. Uh, this goes for things like Dota 2 as well. Why? Because when you start playing the game, you don't need to spend anything. It's free. Um, so they're trying to encourage you to, to, with every little content drop or every little change, every little patch that, 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 that they do, to give you a reason to give, uh, to give them money. I actually feel League of Legends uh, does a pretty philosophical job uh, 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 of how, what they say, this is, a, this is how we're going to make money and this is how we're not going to make money. You know, we're not going to make money by um, by preventing you from ever playing a particular champion, League of Legends is a five-on-five five, uh, sort of hero, uh, hero team versus hero team uh, game, and the idea is, uh, if you want to play a particular hero, even if you don't spend any money, if you just wait long enough, in a couple of weeks, you know, it will come up in random rotation, and you can play it. Um, but if you if you like that experience and you want to continue that experience, then you start paying money. Um, everything in the game that gives you power uh, runes, for instance, are things that you can earn if you play long enough. You don't have to spend money. Um, but if you want, say, custom costumes, cosmetic cha changes, you can spend. Uh, you can pay money for that. Um, I feel that's that's that that feels pretty ethical uh, to me. Uh, their game design is focused on balancing out all of those powers, but you also have to realize that the majority of those companies' resources are dedicated not at balancing the game, but dedicated at trying to figure out how are they going to create content for you to spend money. There are games out there where you literally pay money for power-ups that are going to help you win the game. Uh, maybe nowadays they're not so popular, but they were really, really popular when free to play uh, uh, model was first blossoming in mostly in Asia, in Korea, in China, um, where pretty much the more money that you had, the more power you got, uh, or the more money you 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 were w willing to spend, the more power you got, and the more and the more able you were to actually uh, compete in, in in that game. 
Um, I think that's. I, th I think that's fair if you go into the game knowing that's what it is. That is not actually a competition of skill; is a competition of spending ability. Uh, and you know, if you're aware that's what you're getting into, that's fine. One could argue a lot of uh, high-stakes gambling games are also, you know, sort of that. There is skill involved, yes, but if you don't have the money to go to even start playing the game, you're not going to get in. Um, so. Uh, it's still game design, and it is a there. There are there. There is a philosophy out there, for instance, that progression in the game doesn't need to depend on skill or your or your ability to spend money. It just depends on how much time you're going to sink into the game, right? Yeah. RPGs do this a lot. Uh, anything with like sorry, experience points, uh, where the longer you just keep plugging in the game, the more powerful you're going to get. Uh, a lot of actually single player games on console games uh, also do that. It's all time dependent. And the assumption for that is that you don't have to be good at this game. You just gotta keep playing it and you will become powerful. Uh, and if that's the experience you want, then that's great. And that's gonna be fun because it satisfies your, your expectations. So what I feel about free to play is go in with the expectation that every single thing in the game design is targeted at trying to squeeze money out of you because that's how, that's how the company survives. Um, I'm trying to see. I guess either. I've seen uh, some other game box questions kind of pop up as uh, we've been discussing. Some have asked about uh, how is it possible uh, uh, the screen seems to be getting messy with lots of blocks, and what can we do to uh, make it easier? If you right click on any event and you can click uh, collapse block then it'll actually uh, collapse into a smaller form for you. Uh, so if you know you don't need a particular block and you're not working with it, having a more collapse view allows you to be able to handle uh, your code a lot better. Um, I guess another question that got asked, um, are people going in the course uh, doing game blocks for their assignments. So for the, um, we're just starting week one of the course and the first assignment is to go into the help and f uh, do the intro tutorials uh, for game blocks. Um, as the course progresses, um, people will be building out their digital prototype um, or can build their digital prototype using game blocks uh, to actually apply um, some of the um, apply some of the design concepts and things you learn from the videos and talking with people in the forums and be able to actually uh, put those into practice by attempting to use those within game blocks um, to create your own game. Um, a question that I had promised to answer yesterday um, was what have you found most challenging about designing games? And I, I guess one of the, there, there's, there's kind of the um, trying to figure out exactly what I want kind of the core mechanic of the game to be, but then I spend a lot of time just uh, tweaking the games to be able to um, see, um, you know, how, um, almost level design, how can I make it, uh, how can I make a progression of levels that, are, you know, kind of go from easy to hard and aren't necessarily uh, too easy that they become frustrating for people to be able to uh, uh, go through but also you don't want them to be too hard and uh, that also makes it difficult. Um, there's lots of literature on this that Phil could speak to um, regarding flow and other types of things that kind of from a more academic perspective give you ideas of how to um, make people more engaged as they're, create, as they're playing the game, but really trying to, as you're designing the game and building it, really tweaking for those values, because they can take something that's, uh, you know, something that didn't necessarily seem very fun to begin with, but through iteration and prototyping and testing, you can actually create something that in the end is pretty fun. So like, like tuning so that you can get that feel of the game that you really, really want. And, uh, and that, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, a rabbit hole that I often find myself in. But I tend to have fun doing that, you know? It's like, oh, what if the jump height was just, you know, two pixels higher, you know? Um, because you get immediate feedback as soon as you make that change. 
Um, what I, I find difficult is reminding myself that my personal experience as a designer has nothing to do with how someone is going to play my game for the first time. Right? I've seen every single version of the game from, from conception uh, all the way to the, the, to the version that I'm working on. Whereas if I introduce it to random person at ice cream parlor or, some, uh, or, or some, something, and we have ice cream parlors in MIT, um, then, uh, and I put it in front of them and ask them to play my game, they're going to play the game in a completely different way than I had expected. And just reminding myself, I need to keep finding people that, I never, that has ne never seen my game before to actually play the game because it's tiring. I have to get out of my room and bring my laptop down and let other people touch my keyboard. You know, it's like they've got ice cream on their hands. Um, but uh, but without that feedback, I know I can't actually make a good game. So I force myself to do it. Uh, and just getting over the inertia is by far the hardest. Um, and that in that type of practice is almost true for anything that you build. Building game blocks, it's been critical for us to actually, uh, we bring students here to MIT, um, middle and high school students who don't have any programming background, to see uh, what they understand, what they don't, what they find difficult, what types of games do they want to build but they can't. And uh, kind of putting things in the hands of people, having them test it out. Um, because as a programmer, things are easy for me, and terminology and language that's easy for me, uh, the students most certainly don't know. So it also kind of provides a reality check as we're building things. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question on the class forums about uh, what's kind of like the order of how people actually make games professionally. Um, you've probably heard terms like you know alpha, beta, first playable, vertical slice. Uh, if you follow E3 news, for instance, it, all these words are kind of bandied, bandied around. Um, a lot of it first comes down to who's paying for this, right? Is it a publisher with, say, a license? Um, IDOS has Tomb Raider. I guess it's Square Enix now, um, and. And they need to, and they are looking for a developer to make the next Tomb Raider game. Then it's like, well, that's where the whole project starts, right? It's like, well, we haven't had a Tomb Raider game in a while. Um, let's let's uh, let's milk let's milk that cash cow. Um, and uh, and and they look for the right developer to, uh, to be able to make that. And the developer and they ask the developer, what could you do with this franchise? Um, and that's when they start prototyping. That's when they do things like concept art. Uh, and usually not a full game design document nowadays. There used to be this time where you would pretty much write down every single idea that was going to go into this game in a sort of game des gigantic bible of a, of a document, a uh, digital document usually, that you will you know, send off to your publisher for approval before you were green greenlit for money. That's, I think people have decided that's actually a really time time wasty and expensive way to get stuff done. Uh, pr largely because of the stuff that we've been teaching in this class is that you've got these ideas, but you don't actually know they're any good until you actually play them. So publishers now like to see prototypes. They like to see things that they can actually get their hands on. You can see concept art, for instance. You know, This is the design of a new character. What do you think? And you can uh, offer com a useful comment on that. But when it comes to like gameplay, like you know, this is the kind of climbing we want to have in our game. This is the kind of exploration we want to have in a game. Is if you you can write down everything you want on a piece of paper and make it sound as good as possible. I'm not going to believe it unless I can actually play something. But if I can play something, even if it looks like crap, and it's you know gray boxes everywhere, um, I can start to understand what it is that you're going for. So publishers will do that, and that's the prototyping phase that goes in with concept art, goes in with sort of early character design and world design um, and that's what they, that's the phase that they've got to get to in order to be able to get more cash to keep developing the game. Um, what usually happens is that there is a milestone called first playable uh, which sounds like what we're saying. Um, it is all the tech running on the game engine that they want. The game engine is probably buggy. Doesn't do what you want it to do, uh, and then, but it it does most of the things that you want it to do, and you can sort of say, this is the game engine that we're going to be working with, and this is how we're going to get levels in. This is how we're going to get uh, uh, new characters into our pipeline, uh, and this is kind of a proof to the publisher that the game company has their procedures down. 
you know you've got a, you you've got a way to be able to get all of the content into the the desired platform, be it Xbox One or PC or something like that. Um, then after the first playable, there become a series of playable milestones, um, which people often refer to as vertical slices. It's like this is this is a cross cross section of um, all of the content that we'd like to make, uh, but only one of it. So, for instance, say your game's gonna have 20 guns. This is at the vertical slice. You might make one, just one gun, uh, and you know instead of 15 levels, you've got one level. Instead of 20 bad guys, you've got one bad guy, uh, and that sort of thing. And uh, if you um, if you look at things like Bioshock, they actually have videos of uh, verticals on YouTube. You can Google for that. You, and what you'll see is that for that one slice, they're trying to get it up to the visual quality and gameplay quality that they want for the very, very limited number of things that they're putting into the sense, again, to convince the publisher to give them more money. Um, and if they manage to get past that stage and publisher says this looks good, then they go into production, which is, means that's when the number of people that they have on that company starts to balloon. There a lot of people in game com in the game industry work on contract. It's like, yo, you're, you're going to be working for this n number of months on this one particular game, and you're not actually going to be part of that company until the game has actually gotten past that vertical slice stage. Um, and that is production. It's a long affair. It's the reason why games take years to build. Uh, why some games take years to make, um, and uh, that's where the majority of the money gets spent because you're, you're, because that's when you have the most number of developers on your team. You know, hundreds of people for a triple A game, um, and that continues all the way to if you're a big triple A game, the E3 demo. Uh, uh, Maybe it's the Gamescom demo if you're a European company. Uh, maybe it's the Tokyo Game Show, but it's like one big, usually one big event that you're, where you're going to be taking off the wraps. Your publisher is going to be unveiling this game for the very, very, very first time, and that and usually the few months before that event is total panic mode for the AAA company, um, where they say, "Yes, we do all of the work we need to do in order to get this game to the stores." But forget all that. What do we need to get it ready for specifically this one conference, uh, this this one convention? Um, and there's a lot of hacky code. It doesn't. Not everything in the game is going to work, and they're going to have to like unhack a lot of that stuff after the event is over. But they know they need that because that's when stores, you know, uh, and online stores like Amazon are going to start deciding how many units they want to order from the publisher. Uh, well, then you undo all the damage that you did in order to get that demo to work and you work towards alpha, which uh, the definition of alpha that I've seen, that I like and I use, is uh, feature complete. All your features are in the game, but not, ne not, not necessarily all your content. So sound, certain sound effects might be placeholder, certain graphics might be placeholder. You know, then you may still have gray boxes in your, in, in, in your world, but the game sort of works. You can play it from start to finish, uh, and all of the abilities are in there. They may be untuned, and we were talking about tuning just a second ago. Um, but then you try to get it to the point where, uh, to the next stage, which is beta, where all of your content is also in there. And theoretically, you can play through the whole game, and all the features are in there, but of course there are bugs everywhere. So that is the difference between a, a, a beta release and a gold master, which is the version of the game that you send to the DVD printing press, the, I guess the Blu-ray printing press now. Um, now for online games, for indie games, that whole schedule of course is compressed and you don't have that green lighting stage. You don't have this uh, this moment where you just uh, uh, have to convince someone else to give you money. Uh, you can just start working with the ideas and the prototyping. Uh, that, 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 that's great, you don't have to get clearance, but you still have to do the prototyping because you have to convince yourself that your idea is actually any good before you start making things. But that's why a lot of indie developers sometimes don't work with the prototyping tool. Sometimes they go straight into the tool that they're going to use for the final game. Uh, because they only have to justify it to themselves. They don't have to justify it to anyone else. And time is not of the essence. So hopefully that addresses the question about the different stages of game development. This was a question from the course forums. Any questions about the tech? Uh, um, haven't seen too many. Some people are asking about uh, when game blocks uh, is game blocks available for download? Will it be released and all? Um, so at this point, uh, we just got. 
Uh, we've truly worked very hard to get game blocks out the door and online barely on time for the edX course <laughs> I think. and uh, right now we're focusing on just trying to fix bugs and make the experience as good as we can for people who are using game blocks throughout the course um, after the course is over um, we uh, people will still be able to play games but we'll probably um, take down the editing environment for a bit of time or we may keep it online, we'll have to see. But really we're working to make it as stable and as good as possible for the um, educational games course that's coming in the spring. So as part of that process we'll probably take a lot of the feedback that you guys have given us as we've been building it now and improve the and improve the system, uh, fix larger bugs, add a lot more features that are especially suited for creating educational games and um, then deal with the much larger um, release uh, to a community then. Uh, right now um, the code is not oh, right now the code is not open source and we also don't have a downloadable version. Um, we hope in the long term um, again after the educational games course to be able to uh, create a Chrome app where you can be able to download it and use it on um, have a download on your machine so you don't need internet access but uh, for right now we're truly just trying to get the system working to have people to be able to make games online and be able to do kind of what they can uh, for the course while it's here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, something that uh, not everyone uh, who is watching this might, might know is that this course is actually course number two in a series of educational technology courses called EdTechX. Uh, the first course is actually still running. It's um, design and development of educational technology. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, and then there's, there's this course. The next two courses after that uh, will use game blocks uh, for prototyping. I, I uh, so uh, so one of them in the spring, uh, which is 11.127x, is uh, computer games and simulations for education. And it's actually based loosely off of a similar course that's actually taught here at MIT every spring, where uh, you'll be able to uh, design educational games and uh, basically use some of the uh, framework that you learn from the design and development educational technologies and almost combine that with a lot of what you see from the Intro to Game Design course and put them together to figure out how you can create educational um, game-like experiences uh, for the classroom. Yep. I'm going to try to pull up the next the next question from the forums. Let me see. Rules versus mechanics. People want to want our terms con clearly, concisely, and without resorting to examples. Ah, okay. So. All right. Uh, I can tell you what I what I think is the concise definition, but I'm going to caveat that with the you don't have to agree with me. Uh, what I feel a rule is is just sim sim simply something that tells you what you can or cannot do in a game. The rule could be in code. The rule could be something that uh, is agreed among different people on the field. It could be enforced by certain physical barriers. Uh, you know, that wall, for instance, is going to be the goal. The, is going to be the soccer goal. Uh, but it is telling you specifically what you can and cannot do in the game. The difference between that and a mechanic is that when I use the word mechanic, it is a mechanic is very much a way how a player or a system is going to change the state of the game. So, for instance, in soccer, game mechanic is you can only get the ball from one place to another by kicking it or using your head or your chest but not your hands. You're not allowed to use your hands. The rule is that you can't use your hands. The mechanic is that uh, this is how you're going to change the position of the ball. The rule simply says don't, don't touch the ball with, with your hands. The, uh, the actual game mechanic is this is how you move the ball. This is how you change the state of the game. And by changing the state of the, uh, of the game, changing the position of the ball, you work towards achieving victory. Um, there are people who will disagree with that. There are people who will disagree with the connection between mechanics and the state of the game. But it's something that works for me personally. So, uh, so that's what I use. Now, it doesn't always have to be a player changing the state of the game. The game itself can have a system that changes the state of the game. And if it's this sort of systematic, always running kind of thing, then you, know, you can call it a game 
mechanic or something that happens on very specific instances. So you may have a rule that triggers the use of a certain game mechanic, say the economy, all the values of the stock change based on this stock market mechanic or something like that. I guess I'm resorting to uh, two examples again and that's what the person who requested that question didn't want. So, all right, no more examples. <laughs> Um, so I guess someone recently in the chat asked, is it uh, possible to use this to make an online game? Uh, so we've seen kind of the mini robot thing that I was showing you earlier. Um, if you save the game, and we'll give it a title of uh, Moving Robots, and click Save, and give it a second to hit our server. Um, you'll get this gameplay link at this at the bottom, and if you open this, uh, you'll actually be able to uh, uh, play this game from this particular page. This page, uh, you can give this URL to anyone. It will be gameblocks.org/play/basically-the-game-id, uh, and then you'll be able. Anyone can go to this page and be able to play whatever game that you've made. So even people who aren't uh, registered for the course. So uh, feel free to make a game and then uh, share the play link to have your friends go off and try out what you've built. So you don't need to have an account? In, on, you don't need to have an edX account? This um, so you do need to have an edX account to be able to create uh, games and uh, you just need to create an edX account, register for the course and sign to game blocks and you can do the assignments and everything else. But to uh, play the games that you made, as long as someone has that play link URL, um, they can just uh, type it into their browser and test out what you've made. Okay. Share it with friends. Cool. All right. Let me see. I think we've actually gone through most of the questions on the forums. Um, actually, now something you mentioned earlier was flow, just in behind flow. As a uh, as a concept for people having fun in the game, right? Uh, sure. And uh, for people who who haven't heard about this, this is a big. Th in a nutshell, the theory is that there is. Uh, if you think of of how how difficult a game is based on a sort of uh, two axis graph, I guess two axis graph, no two axis graph. Um, and one axis is how difficult the game is, how, the, how, how difficult the challenges in the game are, and the other axis is how skilled a particular player is at any given time. And the assumption is that you know, the more a player plays a game, the more skilled that player gets. Um, and uh, in many games, the, more, the longer you play a game, the more challenging a game gets, although that's not always the case. Sometimes it means that um, if you're playing chess, for instance, uh, the more times you play chess, and the more you find people who are who are even better uh, than the ones who you played previously, um, the harder the game gets. So the theory of flow is that there is a sweet spot that is very vaguely de de defined, where skill matches up with uh, if the, your, your your personal increase in skill matches up with the the, the increase of challenge, then uh, you will go into this almost zen-like state where you lose track of time and you're so thoroughly absorbed and things around you stop mattering because you are in this flow state. It's not just games. It might happen in any kind of uh, skill-based activity, playing music, for instance, uh, even programming. Uh, yeah, lose track of time and then you look up and it's, oh wow, three hours later, where did all the time go? Um, and uh, so that's a concept that is very easy to articulate. It's very easy to say some. Uh, this is something that happens to people, and Chisan Mihai says these are the things that uh, that give you an idea that you might be in a flow state. But as a design tool, it's really, really hard to use. It's very, very hard to actually implement that into a game just from the theory. There's a lot of things, however, that you can um, keep an eye out for while you are designing a game, especially in the testing phase, to tell whether your game is successfully hitting that. And, you know, for instance, uh, in, Chiksen, in final re, uh, in, in refinements of Chiksen Mihai's theory, there is an assumption that you can't just always be increasing in skill level. You kind of need to give people lulls in action to sort of like, not, once you've learned a new skill, 
you kind of like need to give them a low low stakes chance to actually experiment with that skill before they really really understand how to use it. Um, and then once they once you're sort of confident that they can uh, ma that they've mastered the skill, you can sort of crank up the difficulty and using that skill maybe under more time pressure, maybe just combining that skill with other skills, for instance. So there are these little uh, things that you can keep an eye out for. In the testing phase, it's looking at your players and realize that if suddenly your players stop talking and are just playing your game and really don't want to give you any feedback because they are so engrossed in the game, that's a good thing. Uh, you know, it, it may not be that, that obvious if you weren't looking out for it. Uh, you may start to say, oh, you know, this person doesn't want to talk to me anymore because they hate me, right? You know, they don't want to, uh, uh, they find me annoying or something like that. So, um, so that is a concept that is useful uh, when it comes to things like testing and trying to figure out what's going on in the game. It is not so useful when it comes to coming up with new ideas of what your game is going to be. Um, so yeah. Let's see. Any other game blocks or tech questions here? I see someone's put up the Chiksenmihai link. Uh, uh, if anyone can actually spell Chiksenmihai uh, in the chat, I will be impressed. But if you just copy and paste it in, I am not so impressed. <laughs> I guess uh, we can look at um, one of a game by one of our more active users in the forums. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, so this game was actually... Uh, oh, this, this, this is the Sorokans. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, live streamed um, over the past few days, which with kind of cool graphics after you've uh, exploded the uh, different alien ships. Is, is the explosion asset something that's in game blocks or something that he created? Uh, it's something he created Russian, himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or they created himself. And then if you, oops, and you have a certain number of lives, and if uh, you run out of those, then the game kind of ends. Does the game end or does the game restart? Um, oh, and you can get a coin as you saw. Yeah. It just kind of increased. And I know that there is a uh, there's a boss battle, but I've never seen it. I've never survived. I have not I... gotten far enough to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess it is kind of also close to Halloween. Uh, it is Halloween actually here. Yeah. Uh, which explains the funky thing on my hat on my head right now. Marvin the Marsh. <laughs> oh yeah. Catching bats. Uh, but someone actually uh, took the default uh, uh, bat sprite that's inside of Game Blocks and actually animated it so it has wings that flap, which seems kind of cool and appropriate uh, given the uh, given the holiday coming up. Okay, this uh, I, 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 it, it appears the folks who actually made this game are actually in our chat. So <laughs> go you, good job. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, I think we've almost gotten all of the questions, uh, so I'm, I believe this is the last question, um, that's not something that we could just answer uh, on, 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 actually there is one game box quest question, is that are there mouse over tips when you hover over things in game blocks, or? Uh, Good question. Yeah. Um, so on many of the blocks that we have, if you, uh, if you mouse over the block, uh, there will be a tooltip that kind of appears that tells you uh, what that particular block does. Um, they're on most of our blocks right now, and we're working to improve the um, in improve the documentation on all of our blocks. But if you just move your mouse and hover over any of the blocks, uh, you'll be able to get a description over uh, probably how that block works and functions within the system. All right, so I, I'm uh, actually going to start wrapping up. There's one last question on the forums, which is advice to people who are just starting out. Um, now, even though we design games here in our lab, and you can find links to our games from gamelab.mit.edu or our older stuff from gambit.mit.edu, um, that is, those are games for research. Those are games for us to study and collect data on and write papers on. Uh, you can find the papers on our website as well. Uh, there are people out there who want to go in the game industry. A lot of you in the, in, in the Twitch chat probably uh, have, have, have that 
in, in mind and you're looking at something like this and say this is incredibly basic why you know why is this necessary um, and that's necessary because this is the very first step this is the thing that you need to do in order to get into the habit of improving your skills to the point where you can have someone who could get a job in the game industry but my advice for somebody who's starting out is don't necessarily think that games can only be created by someone in the game industry um, there are people out there, good people out there, who have jobs making money making games. But that is the, not the only place where games can exist. You can make games for your friends, you can make games for your family, you can make games for students in a classroom, which is really why this whole class, uh, why, why this course exists in the first place. Um, you can make games just to express a personal thing to other people who might be interested in your life experience. There's no reason why the definition of games need simply to be restricted by the people who who are out to sell games. Um, there's a lot of excellent work out there and uh, I fully believe that people should be compensated for hard work. Uh, that If you're working in the game industry, my hats off uh, to you, it's a tough job uh, and admittedly not a very well paying job compared to uh, what, you, what else you could be doing with your skills but clearly is the medium that you've chosen to express yourself into. I would say keep your options open. Uh, even if you are working in the game industry, don't forget that you can still make games without necessarily focusing on money. And if you do really want a game career, you really just want to make money in games, uh, what you, you should probably do is get into the habit of making your own games. Um, some people uh, need to go to college to do that, some people don't. Uh, some people need a tool uh, like Gameblocks or Unity or Game Maker or Unreal uh, and some people are quite happy coding everything from scratch and some people would rather be making board games and card games and can build a career out of that too. Um, so just, just make sure that you're in the habit of continually improving your skills because if you just say this is you know I'm happy with where my skills are right now uh, you're not going to do well in the game industry. You might be able to get a job, but you're not going to be able to hang on to it if you're just happy with the way your skills are. So this is this course is really designed just to get people started on that and get used to the discipline of continually challenging themselves and doing something a little bit tougher. Any last words for the screen? Nope. Um, I guess thank you guys for uh, listening in. Um, going definitely off of Philip's point, um, check out Game Blocks while you're. Um, and, and sign into the course and build out mini prototypes to uh, test out your small games to see what you can go off and build and possibly build them into larger things on different platforms but uh, always keep making games this is what you're interested in and uh, have fun with it see ya. thanks guys <laughs>